Here we are on page three, and we will take a moment to fill out these notes. So you can pause the video and copy this down. And then we'll fill out these notes. Now, <clears throat> I want to point something out. If you were to see an area like this, that's really easy to calculate. You just do base times height, right? So make sure you go to the full base. Okay, what if you saw an area like this? Well, it's a little harder, but not that bad. You just break it into a triangle plus a rectangle. The area here is one half base height, whereas this area is just base times height. But what if you saw something like this? That would be a little bit more complicated, and to tackle it, you would need grid lines. Here's what the process would look like. You would find out, well, hey, one box has an area of, I don't know, maybe it's two seconds across, and one box has a height of two meters per second squared. So one box would be four meters per second. Are you getting that? Well, it's base times height. Now that you know how much area one box has, you simply count up the boxes under this curvy graph. So you've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, then, okay, what's this? Five and a half. And then maybe here's the other half, or those two together make up another half, bringing us to six. And then you have, uh, well, seven and eight almost, but this completes number seven, box seven and eight. You know, number nine completes seven and eight. So that's, we're up to eight total. And then this is another half right there, perhaps, or 0. 0.6 maybe. So we have 8.6 boxes, and each is worth four meters per second. And so we could find the area under the curvy graph. Okay. That's a method we'll see coming in the future. Okay, now on to page six. Translation and rotation are different. Rotation is spinning around an axis, but translation would be movement, like along the x-axis or movement along the y-axis, or maybe you do both at the same time. So when a ball rolls down a hill right here, you have translation and rotation. At the bottom, the ball is going at a high linear speed, but it's also rotating at some angular speed. And those two speeds are related, right, by this formula. Now, when we're talking about energy conservation, at the top we just have height, so that's potential energy. At the bottom we have two types of kinetic energy. There's the regular linear energy, or translational kinetic energy, and then we also have the rotational kinetic energy. That pretty well covers part C. However, there's something important to notice. <clears throat> If we were to compare the forces on a rolling sphere, or marble or something, and the forces on a frictionless block, there's actually more resistance in this case. And because you have more force pointing up the ramp, there is less acceleration, less speed, and at the bottom you have less regular kinetic energy at the bottom. What makes up the missing energy? You have more rotational kinetic energy. On the other hand, here, all of the potential converts into kinetic at the bottom. So what are the forces? Well, you've got gravity, mg, of course, or the weight acts on both. You have the normal force pointing off the ramp, perpendicular to the ramp. On the right side, that's it. There's nothing else. But on the left side, what's happening? Well, this sphere is rotating this way, right? And that rotation is speeding up. So at the bottom, that point on the sphere is rotating this way if we follow around the circle. Which means if it's speeding up, if the rotation increases, there must be a force 
pointing with the rotation. And that force is static friction. Okay. So you have here that force of static friction provides the extra resistance up the ramp, which lowers the acceleration and produces less of the translational kinetic energy at the bottom. Now there's an important concept here. We're going to come back to part D on this question. But first, we've already got notes on torque. First, we need to write down Newton's second law. Oh, that's F net equals MA, right? Second law, your ma, the second most important person in your life. If we apply this to angular momentum, force has an analog of torque. Mass has an analog of moment of inertia. Acceleration is similar to angular acceleration. So this equation says torques produce angular acceleration. Hang on a second. Go back to this problem at the bottom. Page six, is it? Yeah. If we look at this scenario here on the left, we've got some good notes coming. Already started here. OK. Where does the torque come from to speed this thing up from, you know, maybe it starts at zero, and at the bottom, this uh, angular speed would be whatever the linear speed is over r, right? I've just rearranged this equation. So it, it sped up on the way down. It speeds. Where uh, does that acceleration come from? Where is the torque coming from? Well, let's remember torque is force times the distance from the pivot times the sine of the angle between the two. If we zoom in on the ball, gravity acts at a distance of zero meters from the pivot. So gravity produces no torque. Produces, it's supposed to be produces no torque. Moreover, the normal force acts right here at the uh, contact point, right? So this is supposed to be a circle. Let's try that again. It's a little better. Gravity acts at the contact point right there at the bottom. So, okay, well, what's the value of r? Uh, okay, well, the pivot is right at the middle. That's it spinning around that pivot axis. So r, the distance from that pivot, in the green to the force, there's r, the radius, but the angle between them is 180 degrees, you could say, or maybe you call it zero. Both are valid. So what does that do to the torque? There is no torque from the normal force. So now we have Fn produces no torque. And the only torque, the net torque, is from static friction alone. But the angle is 90 degrees, because if we look at static friction, static friction points back this way, and R is like this. The friction force is tangent. That's a 90 degree angle. So sine of 90 is one, and we can leave it off. That's gonna be important when you try to solve part D, uh -huh. the net torque, remember, is I times alpha. And the net torque also, let's do it like this, is equal to the friction force, static friction, times the radius, times the sine of 90. And don't forget, that alpha is the change in speed over change in time. So using these equations, we can solve for the friction force on the sphere. Because we know this, we can find this, and we know this. OK, we're finished with this page and on to page 9. Uh, just a couple things left. <laughs> no, a couple here doesn't mean two people who hold hands. 
Um, not sure what happened to this person. There they are. There's their hand. Instead, a couple is two forces that produce net torque, but the net force is zero. So net torque is not zero. F net is zero. If you look at this example, we could imagine this entire thing, uh, this whole bar here with the two spheres, imagine it as a single point mass. And we would have a total mass there of eight, right? That's four plus four. There would be a force pointing up, equal and opposite force pointing down. They would cancel each other. And the net force is zero if we treat it as a point mass. What about the net torque? Well, when we're dealing with torque, we cannot treat it as a point mass because torque depends on where exactly the force is applied. All right, then, looking at the torque, <clears throat> if this is the pivot, this force will try to turn it clockwise. That's a negative torque. And this force will try to turn it clockwise as well, a ne another negative torque. And so you could find the net torque right, using fr sine theta. Um, now, first, though, we're going to do moment of inertia. Remember, that's the sum of all the masses times how far they are squared. So there's two masses in this case. So you have to do this twice. Net torque. There are two fr sine thetas. They're both negative. I'm already helping you out there. Angular acceleration. Oh, hang on. What equation relates torque, moment of inertia, and angular acceleration? It's Newton's second law. Net torque is the rotational mass times the angular acceleration. So torque is kind of the same thing as force. It's like a turning force. This is the same thing as mass, but just for rotation. This is the same as acceleration, except just for rotation. It's the same equation. All right, you can use that equation to find alpha. Find the tangential acceleration. Oh, don't forget the, the equations. Whoops. That take our angular quantities and turn them into rotational quantities. So here we're just using alpha times the radius. Can calculate the angular speed after four seconds. Assume it begins at rest. That's the initial speed. This is time. You know the you know this value and you're looking for the angular speed after. That's the final angular speed. Find the centripetal acceleration. That's AC after four seconds. So remember the equation omega squared r. You know this at the end of four seconds, so you can find this. Explain why the acceleration increases as time passes. So think about uh, the centripetal acceleration. Think about this equation to answer that one, part G. OK. What's the radius, by the way? Well, the whole length is 6. So what's the radius? I'll let you think that through. Finally, page 10. <clears throat> Newton's second law, we could take acceleration and plug in the definition, change in velocity over change in time. But wait a second. Mass times change in velocity, the numerator here, is the change in momentum because mass times any velocity is just the momentum and if you're changing the velocity then you're changing the momentum and then we have t on the bottom so we've proven another way to express newton's second law this is another form of newton's second law in fact this is the form he originally wrote it down as so the same way that we have momentum is mass times velocity Angular momentum will be the product of what and what. Mass is the same as rotational inertia or moment of inertia. 
angular velocity is the same as, I'm sorry, velocity is the same as angular velocity or angular speed. We're not really looking at its direction. This. Okay. So, starting from this, uh, well, using this, adapt it to rotation and derive this equation. It's the same process that we just uh, you know, produced for, for linear motion. I want you to try uh, applying it to torque and rotational motion. So then answer these questions. You know, if you, if you use the equation net torque is delta L over delta T, if the net torque is zero, how much does the angular momentum change? And if the angular momentum doesn't change, <laughs> kind of giving away the answer, if it doesn't change, that means that the value initially equals the value at the end. You know, if you have 15 initially, then you'd have 15 at the end. Uh, but what's the unit for angular momentum? Well, let's look here. This is in units of, I is in units of kilograms meters squared, and this is in units of radians per second, which is just going to turn into seconds to the negative one. So if you look at this equation, we know that L is mass times velocity. Momentum is mass times velocity. So you could plug in on the left, I times um, uh, omega, and you could plug in on the right, I times omega. And you get this equation. So you'll see how we could apply this to scenarios where there's, you know, an ice skater spinning with her hands out. We kind of talked about this. And she has some axis of rotation. And then she brings her hands in and speeds up. She's going much faster now. Here she was going slower. So if I were to tell you that her initial moment of inertia was 40 and her final was much less because her arms are in now, so maybe 30, if she's initially spinning at, you know, 5 radians per second, what would her final angular speed be? Well, you could plug into this equation. We know this and this. We know this, so we can find the final speed. So that's how we'll be solving equations, some equations using conservation of angular momentum. So in, in addition to some problems, uh, one of the things we'll do to practice is fill out page 11. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Use an S for displacement, because that's what they like in IB. Uh, for the linear displacement. Of course, the rotational analog is not S, something else. And fill out this entire chart as well as this chart.